Way back in the middle 70s, Morley Safer took a look at a British institution that survives more or less intact, a piece that deserves another look a decade later. Come to Britain. That's what the travel posters say. And we do, millions of us, carrying with us our own special baggage of national characteristics. We like England. We share a heritage and a language. Englishmen sometimes poke fun at what they call our transatlantic manners. And many Americans are overwhelmed by their elegance, even the stateliness of English life. We tend sometimes to think of England in almost Shakespearean terms. Well, that's partly true, but only partly true. This royal throne of kings, this sceptered isle, this earth of majesty. This seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise. This happy breed of men, this little world. This precious stone set in the silver sea. This blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England. This England as seen by the ad men who make the BOAC commercials, by those who print the Come to Britain posters. This England as American Anglophiles like to think of England. But for the Englishmen on vacation, at least one in 50 of them, this England is this England. This England is the England of a phenomenon unknown in the rest of the civilized world, a phenomenon called butlins. Vacation camps named after their founder, Sir Billy Butlin. If you suspect that we're exaggerating the phenomenon, then we begin with the way Butlin sees itself. A come to Butlin's commercial. They are set in places no tourist ever gets to or much less ever hears of. And Butlin's offers to the Englishman at leisure a peculiar brand of impossibly English pleasure. <laughs> the English have always been a baffling curiosity to their European neighbors and their American friends. But nothing baffles an English watcher more than the English at play. One million people every year spend good money to endure a kind of folksy survival course in which everything seems designed for anything but a holiday. Unlike the rest of the civilized world, the Englishman on holiday is not trying to get away from it all. He's trying to find out just how much he can put up with. A test to see if his dignity can withstand monsoon rains and arctic temperatures. And apparently, nature is not harsh enough. At what they euphemistically call holiday camps, they employ a whole staff of people to test his backbone, his patience, and the stiffness of his upper lip. The redcoats, they are called. Uniformed counselors who are there to ensure that privacy is kept to a minimum. They are a mixture of cheerleader and tormentor. Ladies and gentlemen, the Red Coats. If you've got two legs, you can do it, but if you haven't, you can't. Their motto could be fun through adversity. Four decades ago, Sir Billy Butlin, an ex-carnival man, realized that what an Englishman wants most out of a vacation is organization, routine, discipline, not escape and relaxation. So he provided it. It's not as simple as exploiting the British competitive spirit on what might loosely be called the field of sport. It's 
like a Roman circus with everyone in the audience taking his turn in the arena. A Butlin's vacationer is somewhere between a second century Christian in Rome and a 15th century victim of the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> We need something to balance the cup and saucer. You have a balloon between your legs, cup and saucer on each hand, cup and saucer on your head. You have to balance, walk up around that chair, back again. And all of it in the best British tradition of, quote, being a good sport. Experienced Butlin's holiday makers, lifers they call them, complain that the harsh discipline of the 30s has all but disappeared, that young redcoats do not have much imagination at meeting out indignities. And then there's the food. Butlins offers their guests no shocks or surprises in this department. They boast their campers consume enough tea each year to float an ocean liner, enough baked beans and potatoes to sink one, and untold millions of fried eggs. It's not surprising that the British government converted some of the pre-war holiday camps to prisoner of war camps during the 40s and then they were just as quickly turned back into holiday camps after hostilities. This is radio wrapping, according with the highlights of your evening's entertainment. In the Guilty Theatre at 6.30 this evening, holiday magic with the Resident Review Company. At 10 o'clock in the Big Whistle, the Phillips Pop Vocal Contest, when anyone between the ages of 14 and 39 has the chance to win a recording contract with Phillips. The remainder of your evening's entertainment is as printed in your entertainment's program. The Miss Chi Chi competition to find the most charming, cheerful, chubby lady guest is now taking place in the Prince's Ballroom. legs competition. And always a good old-fashioned dash of Anglo-Saxon vulgarity. Come as close to the screen as you can, girls. Want to see those knees? Number 44, it looks like you've got a wedding dress on. If you can lift it up. Look at this lot. They're going to lift something up here. Look at this. 
I'll turn your card round, 52. I'm not trying to get a peep. It's got to go up a lot more. It's blue. I can see it's blue. Yeah! A three, a four, and a one. A two, a one, a two, a three, and a leap. Yes, better. Critics of Butlins claim they have gone too far in this business of regimentation, that guards patrol the barriers with trained to maim Alsatians, looking for stray campers. We noticed only a few guard dogs who were really not that vicious. After a week or two weeks of prodding and pushing, soaking and freezing, of relentless competition, of harassment and baiting, of the kind of abuse that would get any self-respecting Englishman up in arms if it were animals treated thus, the vacation is almost over. It is midnight. Campers and redcoats and other tormentors gather in the Gaiety Theater for one last inspection and a few old songs. In the morning, they are free. Sixty minutes. A CBS News weekly magazine will continue. Wednesday, Billy D. Williams and Ken Wall babysit a murder witness. That's what you said you got a sweep. And become targets for revenge on Double Dare. You gonna do something? I am. I'm ducking. Then, he's been dead and in the cryonic deep freeze for over ten years. A mistake turned miracle brings him back. He's alive. But is he still human? Oh. Chiller, Wednesday. This is CBS.